Hello, Sermon Brainwave listeners and viewers. This is Matt Skinner. I'm inviting you to join Caroline, Joy, and me at Ghost Ranch in New Mexico from July 29 through August 2, 2024. Just visit Working Preachers homepage, click on the link under Preachers Retreat, and you can register. Space is limited, so sign up today. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. The text uh, for the third Sunday of Lent, which falls on March 3rd, 2024. The first reading is from Exodus 20, verses 1 through 17. Our psalm is the 19th psalm. The second reading is 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. And we are returning to the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verses 13 through 22 this week, as the Passover draws near. And Joy, you still got a a voice issue. Yeah, I thought it was going to get better. It it decided it was going to um, hold on. That's hard for a preacher and a teacher. Yeah, um, my students are laughing at me now. They're not laughing with me anymore. (laughs) And don't make me laugh because that's when they laugh at me because if I laugh, it's over. Okay, all right. So this is going to be a very, very... We'll have to be very serious. This is a very serious podcast. I've had listeners tell me I'm not as funny as I think I am. So I'll just believe (laughs) that for this one. (laughs) All right. Well, we've got John 2. So our next three Sundays are the 3rd, the 4th, and the 5th, and Lent are all uh, readings from John in year A. And as I mentioned last week, as we move through this uh, season of Lent, what I was struck by is, is the way in which we are consistently reminded of the promises of the promise of the resurrection in the midst of this travel to the cross and that it's while we might kind of uh, like or or used to this sort of linear <laughs> linear journey to the cross in reality our life is about the it, the intermingling of both the cross and the resurrection and then also both of you talked about that importance of the hindsight right of of that resurrection perspective, looking back, uh, looking back on the interpretation of Jesus' ministry and particularly his death, and so we get a direct reference to that. All of this is to lead up to Pooh twenty-two. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word Jesus had spoken. So this reflection on the past in light of the revelec- of the resurrection is this remembering. And that's particularly important for this passage because it 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 is the because of the focus on the body and what mm-hmm. difference does it make that uh, that you have here in this gospel, the the promise of the Word made flesh, and then uh, and then the, these you know bodily appearances, resurrection appearances, and John that are looking back to and and trying to make sense of the fact that God's glory, God's revealing of God's self, was in this body, this flesh of Jesus, and that we can't. That and that's part of the cross, I think, and that's part of the the crucifixion, and it's part. It's all connected with a focus on the glory of God in a human body and the fullness of what the flesh and the incarnation mean. And so, for John, the cross is is what happens when something is incarnate. You die. That's that's what it is. And so, uh, so those are th- that how we can pull some of those into this passage in particular, because the, the temple incident has the function in the gospel of a very specific theological function. And that is to reiterate one fourteen. 
And so, um, which also I think is a really important, uh, a really important point is so that this doesn't become, uh, the temple is no longer needed. We don't need the temple, blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden we've, uh, gone into the directions of anti-Semitism. So some initial thoughts. What? <laughs> no, just the way that ended. And then you said some initial thoughts. Those were like big thoughts at the very end. <laughs> I thought that was massive. So all of my thoughts are big. Those are big. I have big, big, big thoughts. No, I'm not saying I'm surprised. I'm just like thinking, I don't know how to honor that with a good transition, but. Oh, yeah. <laughs> cough. There you go. <laughs> the I, I appreciate the the question about falling into anti semitism. So I don't want to like let that hang in the air. No, no, no. I want to follow up with it. That. Maybe we'll come back to that because I yeah. do think so often when I hear people refer to the quote unquote temple incident, which in John is of course quite different than other places. It's I think it's a really misunderstood text, or I think what we do, we often supply a lot of assumptions that aren't in the text right. and that don't hold up very well to the historical realities about the economy around the temple. And John's, I think, is particularly troublesome because it it seems like he's just upset about uh, mercantilism, right? The, the buying and selling of things. But there's more going on with the zeal for my father, zeal for the house. Uh, will consume me. So I just, uh, I just think I want to flag that and make sure we come back to that later. Um, but the stuff about the, about the body and the, and the, and the resurrection, I think is really helpful because then it asks us the question of like, okay, so what, <laughs> what is the body then in John's imagination? It's, it seems to be a new temple of sorts, right? Mm -hmm. Or that this idea that uh, then, so what's then, wrong with the old one what's deficient about the old one what's maybe less helpful about the old one none of that is i think explained in the text and it could be just as simple as the, the problem with the old temple is that it was destroyed right you know what i mean not by anybody's doing right to save the romans um but then it's this question of how do we, <laughs> we're moving through time here. Like, how do we imagine this in a setting both prior to the destruction of temple of the temple during Jesus's life, and then also post right. destruction of the temple? Like I would want to say in verse 22, after he was raised from the dead, his disciples remember that he said this. I want to know what did they remember after the temple was destroyed? You know what I mean? Like in the mm. year 90 or a hundred or whatever. Like, yeah. And so it just gets to the question of how does our theology, how does our understanding of Jesus's death and resurrection um, adapt or change based on what we're going through, what the crisis is, where God appears to be present, where God appears to be absent. That was a really long walk to get us there. I realize. sorry about that, but you're trying, trying to, to make a big funny. thought. I'm trying. To, I'm trying to help Joy's voice. <laughs> um, She's not. Yeah, uh, but you know what I mean. It's 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 getting at this thing, uh, this question of like, uh, of course, this is going to mean something different to you in different times and places. Of course, this text will mean something different to you if you've had a loved one die in, in the last year. Of course, this text will mean something different to you if your own body is is changing or letting you down. Of course, this text will mean something different. If you sensed a deliverance or a kind of renewal in which God was involved in this last year, I don't know. Hopefully, it's not taking what you were saying and going too far down an off ramp, Caroline. But what it does for me is two things, Caroline. Your in the text reading, um, I think, becomes a balance for us in this, um, because what you're saying, Matt, is what's in the text is. The disciples came to this understanding after the resurrection. And this understanding lifts up um, Jesus, that God took on flesh and dwelt among us. You know, back to 114. And I confess, so often when I read this text, I'm drawn to the economy of the temple. Or I'm drawn to, I remember I remember a church I was uh, going to be serving, and uh, this text, uh, I found out about it as this text was coming up. 
And I learned that the church had an incredible marketplace in the church. And all I wanted to do was to be a literalist with this text and to say, you can't be selling all of this stuff because it makes Jesus mad. And what I began to realize is that that was actually the problem of what was happening with with these folks in the temple. They were hearing Jesus too literally and were missing the larger reality that this text points to. God with us. God not in a temple, a temple that historically God didn't ask for because God created the icon of divinity in flesh. The male and female, the image of God. God granted what we asked for to give a temple. But God's spirit never descended on the second temple in the way that it descended on the first temple. The awe of the first temple was never experienced in the second temple. And I would tease this out. And I, I'm just thinking of some lessons I learned from uh, a, a colleague uh, who's gone on now, Mary Fisher, an Australian uh, professor. And she taught, the, well, she centered on the fact that the glory of God in the first temple was never experienced in the second. But it also made me realize what we read a couple of weeks ago from Jeremiah, that God's expectation is that God's spirit is going to be on our hearts. So there it is again, back incarnate, not in a space. And what was it that Israel was to be? When Israel got it right, people saw a peculiar people. It wasn't the grandeur of their temple. Other people had awesome temples. It definitely wasn't the grandeur of the second temple. But it was what they did. And what they did was how they cared for the other when they followed the, the, the law, that they attended to the foreigner, that they cared for the immigrant, that they treated their slaves differently than everybody else. And that's in this text. Jesus is upset because they're getting the practices for worship right, but they're not doing the practices of loving neighbor, which is what all of this has always been about. This passage is very different, both in location and purpose, than the Synoptic Gospels. So the Synoptic Gospels, the uh, the criticism is a den of thieves or a den of robbers. Here, it's stop making my father's house a marketplace, which it had to be, period. The temple doesn't function if, unless it's a marketplace. That's the whole point. And so, but that that contextuality is so critical because then it could be that you could say, well, that you know, that Jesus is against the temple. He is not against the temple. He's, He's a Jew. He's there for Passover. And so that's not the issue. It's that's why you just have to come back to John's theological purpose, and, and which is this is the this is. This is the first embodiment of 114. The word became flesh and tabernacled among us. Skenao, tent, tabernacle. So the purpose is to see that, um, not to discount the temple, but to see that's where like the present and like the post 70 is a little complicated, just a little, but to see that God is now in is is dwelling in Jesus and for people to be able to see that and know that and recognize that. And so that's another thing about this passage is that you have to carry it forward into for example John 4 where where the woman at the well is like well if you're a prophet then tell me where I'm supposed to we're supposed to worship because you say in Jerusalem and we have our temple in Mount Gerizim and Jesus says neither neither this temple nor Jerusalem. Fast forward to John 9, where Jesus finds a man who has been born blind, who is healed, who's been thrown out. And Jesus says, uh, it, um, he says, Lord, I believe and worshiped him. That's the whole, right? Do you see what I'm saying? And so it's- it's That's like Jeremiah too. 
Yeah. And, but it's really, it's not about, um, it is about the recognition, this really bold Christology that says God is now present in Jesus. And, uh, and, and, and that's that's not a rejection of the temple. It's not a rejection of Judaism. It is this, and and for Paul for for John to connect this abide this abiding of God, abiding of Jesus, this dwelling of Jesus back to the wilderness wanderings. That's a content. It's a continuity, and so that's why the we have to be really careful that with this passage because we could easily say the temple isn't doesn't matter anymore, and that's just not true. And I want to look at where God, where God breathes God's spirit again. Mm-hmm. You know where 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 that Shekinah glory shows up again, or maybe the question I should ask is why. Because it's not showing up for the temple practices. The temple practices are to point us to God showing up. And and when it's reversed, um, even in the rejection of the temple or the rejection of Judaism, we're rejecting how God has, to to say what you said last week, non-negotiably, not unconditionally stated how God is going to function and how God is going to deliver God's promise and presence. So we can't dis, we can't dismiss it. Um, I think that's why our reading it in continuity and our reading the text echoing and anticipating is an important way of looking at all of scripture. Otherwise you get into one little place and you become like they were in this moment where, you know, who do you think you are? You're going to destroy this temple it took 46 years to build? And it's like, wait a minute, you guys missed the point. And Caroline pointed us to what the point is, that God has taken on flesh and dwelt among us. Mm-hmm. Okay, we should go on. And I know I got a little excited about that. But, you know, we're back in John. You got and- a little excited. You did. It's just <laughs> happening. So. Yeah. You still have you still have things in your notes that you didn't get to though, did you? Oh yeah. But you know, that's it's just the moving right along. <laughs> I am increasingly loving um the setup for Exodus twenty. Uh for sorry, the setup in Exodus twenty uh for the commandments. Um uh mm-hmm. in that it is a reminder of what God did to and for Israel in order to say, I am your God. They had seen God set them free. They had seen God overpower uh, Pharaoh and Egyptian, the Egyptian uh, military. They had seen God um, um, manipulate uh, nature to bring uh, water from a rock and uh, manna from heaven and um, um, plagues and um, to even death and could tell death how far to stay, just as God told the waters and the parting of the Red Sea how far to stay and when, you know, to 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 come back down again. And it is after that that God makes this covenant that is conditional. None of the other covenants have been conditional. The covenant with Noah, no condition. The covenant with Abraham, no condition. But here, now I've shown you who I am and what I can do. And I'm going to ask you for this in return. Follow this. And what are we following? We're following how to love God's creation in humanity by trusting God will provide. A God who will provide for us means we don't have to work 24-7, 366. I think this is a 366-day year. Um, A God who will provide means I don't have to steal or covet what another has. 
A God who is a God of life means I don't have to take life. A God who has cared for me means I can honor my ancestors. If I trust God, knowing what God is and has done, then I can keep these commandments because God is able to keep me. I love reading Exodus with that in mind. And I would end it, since we're looking toward the crucifixion, or more importantly, the resurrection. If God can handle raising Jesus from the dead, God can probably still handle supplying our needs. I would do this separately from John's gospel. <laughs> yeah, why, why is that, Matt? We've got some important uh, texts here. And like, Joy, you just talked about this, the, the beauty of this kind of this, these covenantal promises, this idea mm -hmm. of... of of Exodus not just being getting out of trouble, but now building a new nation with that, you know, to borrow from elsewhere is going to be a, a different kind of nation in the world, um, which we see elsewhere in Exodus and elsewhere in Leviticus. Uh, we see Psalm 19 with its, with its praise about the law of the Lord. I worry about pairing that with John 2 and with 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Um, because it's, in, unless a preacher is willing to take on all four passages, if you're going to read all four passages, you better preach on all four passages and help people get a sense for Jesus in the temple, not making a statement of replacement. Mm -hmm. And Paul in mm -hmm. 1 Corinthians 1, not saying, you know, when he says Jews demand signs, mm -hmm. uh, that that is, uh, or also the idea of God's foolishness being wiser than human wisdom, that there's not an implicit um, supersession going on or something like that. Mm -hmm. I just think it's, we talk sometimes about certain ethically charged passages and say, if you're going to read this passage, make sure you preach about it. And and this is one yeah. where if you're going to put the law next to 1 Corinthians 1 and John 2, make sure you... <laughs> <laughs> you have a place for all of those things that you don't turn Jesus into somebody who's turning over a, a law that is just about religion or just about proving your worth, which as you said, joy is absolutely not what that, what the, what Exodus 20 is trying to describe. See what I mean? I'm worried about the implicit lectionary. I'm worried about the implicit sermon that doesn't get preached, but is there in the reading of these texts. In the reading. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree with that. And too, it, too. it's in part, you know, what was behind my caution, my initial caution with with John 2 and how homiletically <clears throat> we need to be and exegetically, we need to be really, really careful with what we how we interpret that text. Uh, and I, 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 I absolutely agree. I, it's one of these. It, yeah, I, it's one of those Sundays where. Maybe maybe you just preach on one, or yeah, you don't read. You know, or, or, well, you definitely preach on one. Like I don't, I I I don't need. I would not even make any attempt to connect any of these with John. Not zero. Uh, and but but reading them aloud and what they sound like, uh, unless you're really really careful with that. And I, even like since we're kind of jumping around a little bit, like I was just I landed on on first Corinthians, just on its own, without trying to connect it to anything. <laughs> uh, and just, and, and just using the lens of the homiletical lens of, of the combination of wisdom and foolishness as a lens for Lent. Um, that, 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 how is it that Lent is this, this really season of wisdom and foolishness uh, that are, that are, uh, that are, present together, collide together in our own interpretations and in our own experiences. Uh, what do we, what do we say is wisdom, but really is foolishness? What does we say is foolishness, but really wisdom? I mean, I would just kind of like kind of explode that uh, homiletically and just take that, take that on its own using, using Paul's, this opening of Paul's letter to the first Corinthians as a, as a as a thematic lens for what we experience in Lent, so completely separate from all the other stuff that we just talked about. Yeah, and when and how is the power of God experienced? I mean, to use that mm -hmm. line from First 
Corinthians, and it doesn't have to be just one way, which is sometimes right. the the trap that we fall into to say, well, if it's right. experienced this way, then it can't be all these other ways. Or if I like this kind of worship, God can't be experienced in that kind of worship. And and to, mm -hmm. to, to maybe call people into a, a, a way of mutually appreciating. I mean, you know, it's, there's just a lot going on with this, with all these four together. Mm -hmm. right. um, but instead of it being the goal is to figure out the right kind of worship to go to the woman at the well in, in John chapter four, Right. What if instead it's where does God's power become experienced? And I think that's a that's a really powerful question for Lent, isn't it? I mean, where yeah. do we see powerful, powerful question? Huh? A powerful question. It's a powerful question. About the power of God. About the power power. Of God. Yeah. Where do we see it revealed? And 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 where do we expect it to be revealed? Which is the wisdom and foolishness, right? That I was trying to get at, but but also that that you know that we see th that revelation of god in uh, what one of the things i've been talking about lately with john 114 is that uh <laughs> that when, john 114 sorry <laughs> joy led uh, you here is is going back to it is is looking at the word there the word the word the word became sarks yeah. it did not become anthropos right and uh, it did not become man; it became Sarks, and that uh, that for me that also opens up your question, Matt, of where do we see the glory of God, um, and where do we experience the the glory and the power of God? Uh, and no, you know, no wonder Peter <laughs> might have had an issue with the fleshiness, right? This fleshiness, yes. yeah. this Sarks of God that is showing up in Lent uh, and that will, that will reveal itself on the cross in all the fleshiness. And how is it that we, um, how is it that we talk about that fleshness um, during this, during this liturgical season? And for me, that's the foolishness of the Decalogue because. Ooh. Back to Exodus. Really, yeah, it really is fleshy. I mean, it would be really nice if it was just, you know, no idols, worship me. But it's, you know, trust in God to provide so you don't have to steal. Covet. Making, you know, keeping your oaths and, you know, honoring marriage and being faithful in your relationships. You know, family, honoring your ancestors. That's fleshy. <laughs> I don't know about your family, but my family, that's, yeah, that, it seems foolish. Yeah, so, so, yeah, I, 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 I'm, 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 anybody with me on the Ten Commandments can go with me on this one. <laughs>